Let's discuss on-site oil analysis for aviation applications or also airport applications. When we talk about aviation assets, we really are talking about aircraft. Um, there's a lot of aircraft out there. The global aircraft uh, fleets are growing and continuing to grow. There's approximately 30,000 airliner or freightliners in service today. Those are wide body jets that everybody's familiar with, with flying. There's also about 22,000 business jets out there that are using a variety of different um, uh, engine types. And then, of course, there's many, many hundreds of thousands of individual small aircraft that are currently in the in, in, uh, worldwide today. All of these fleets are growing fast as the need for air travel continues to improve. Oil analysis is widely used in the aviation industry and has been used for many years. The benefits are well understood and well known. When we talk about assets and types of equipment, we mentioned about the large aircraft, of course, smaller aircraft and helicopters. Those are all considered aircraft. And anytime we talk about that, there's a couple of major lubricated assets that we want to be thinking about. For the most part, we're going to talk about aircraft engine types. There's different designs, turbofan, turbojet, turboprops. There's also piston engines. The majority of them have similar lubricants, but there are different lubricants depending on the application. There's other types of lubricated components in an aircraft, specifically hydraulic systems, uh, gearbox systems, also APUs or auxiliary power units. And then regarding the airport aspect of things, there is a lot of ground support equipment that support the aircraft before it gets in the air, such as gen sets, air handler systems, or fuel transfer systems. When we talk about oil analysis, however, let's talk about the key challenges that are there. There's a high performance concern for fleets nowadays. There's a carbon footprint reduction pressures that they're under. There's also the push to reduce oil consumption and reduce cost, of course, because that has to keep in line with revenue. Oil analysis has been used for many years to be able to identify uh, uh, wear issues as well as look for reliability concerns because that safety is above all as the most critical component of air travel. But in terms of on-site oil analysis, it's been looked at heavily nowadays because it can help in each one of these particular areas. Why? Because analysis on-site is in minutes, not hours, while you're waiting for an off-site facility. It's also the technology today is sensitive to extremely small trend changes or moves in the trend. That's very important because of the unique aspects of aviation um, oil, uh, concerns. There's also enhanced wear debris analysis capabilities. Who does uh, on-site oil analysis? Well, the United States Air Force has been doing it for many years. They probably have the largest program in the world from a military perspective. It's under the JOPE or Joint Oil Analysis Program. Does well over 25 million samples tested. They've got an extensive database. The uh, rules and, and diagnostics are, are well understood and published. Many worldwide militaries also take uh, uh, do on-site oil analysis. Several commercial airlines and many aircraft maintenance centers also have that capability to support their fleets. What's unique about uh, on-site oil analysis or aviation oil analysis is that it must account for some of the unique conditions that are specific to aviation applications. Specifically, we talked earlier about the, the, the type of engines. Uh, OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers of those engines, are very heavily involved in guidance, not just at the warranty phase, but after the warranty phase, because there is a continuous request throughout the life of the systems to be able to be engaged. And of course, the OEM guidance is critical, especially if there's any accidents, there has to be some traceability to what's going on. Lubricant formulation is a uh, is also something that has to be considered when you're dealing with aviation oil analysis. What's unique about uh, aviation lubricants is that the governing body is not so much ASTM, but the SAE, or Society of Automotive Engineers. Their technical committees are the ones that bring the engine manufacturers, the uh, airframe manufacturers, the oil companies, and the aviation authorities all together to agree on certain standards for safety and for reliability. 
uh, one of the major umbrella standards out there is the SAE AS5780. Um, it's a widely used uh, standard. It's for uh, turbofan and turbo engine applications. Uh, it refers to um, lubricants that are oftentimes hindered ester bases or fully synthetic fluids. Uh, many of them are also used for gearbox applications. There are two different duty cycles. The typical is what we call standard performance capability. And increasingly, as the industry moves towards higher performance requirements, they're looking for higher performance uh, capability, which essentially is looking for uh, greater uh, temperature uh, and longer, um, longer uh, oxidation resistance. There's also uh, international bodies that also do inter um, certified uh, lubricants. One is uh, the UK standard, DEF 9191. It's more of a fuel type lubricant style. There's also Russian and other uh, Japanese standards as well. Um, you also must consider not only the lubricant formulation guides and standards, but you should also consider the fuel that's been used in aviation applications. So the majority of wide body airliners and turbo uh, gas turbine fired systems are using a kerosene based type of uh, product, such as Jet A or JP8 for military applications. However, for piston engine applications, Avgas, which is a, 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 a variant that is still widely used, um, it's like a, a gasoline blend. One example is something called 100 LL, which is low lead. It's a leaded gasoline with anti NAC compound and is still widely used in the piston engine applications. You also should consider the filtration that is used on an engine. Because these filters are very high performance, high efficiency, micron rating, and this is a chip detectors that are also included in the engine for safety purposes. Aviation hydraulics are also another area of concern for uh, oil analysis. Uh, the hydraulics have to have fire resistance um, for prevention of fires uh, as a result of any accidents. Phosphate esters are widely used in those situations. They're designed for um, a specific application. They don't do well um, outside of that application, um, especially seal performance is considered. What you don't want to have is a mixing of these hydraulic fluids by a mineral base with a phosphate ester. Um, you also have to concern yourself about coolant and dilution getting in or, or also debris ingression. These are concerns for hydraulic systems. So what are the important tests in uh, aviation oil analysis and what's the, the, the real concerns that are unique to this particular industry? Well, tr the, one of the key things that we want to be watching for or looking for is trace wear metals, contaminants and additives. Those are pretty much used, tested throughout the entire industry. Um, how is it done? It's done by elemental analysis by, uh, by atomic emission spectroscopy. That can be uh, RDE, that can be ICP, it can be a variety of different techniques out there. Why it's important is because it's looking for early signs of adhesive, fretting wear, uh, or abrasive wear. It's also looking for contaminant ingression. It also can be looking at the additive package in the oil. Uh, what's unique to aviation is that the alarm limits are extremely low uh, for that. What do I mean by that? You might have a condemnation limit of 1.5 ppm for chromium, for instance. Um, it's a combination of the volume of the, the, the fluids in the boxes, but also the, the concern about early, early warning signs. Uh, they want to see zero or less than... Uh, uh, zero, <laughs> ideally, in some of these. They'll often do a combined alarm system as well, where you'll have something like maybe six parts per million for a combination of chrome, copper, nickel, iron combined, where the number must not reach that number. Again, it's another way of having an extremely low number. Another thing that you'll see for aviation is the demand for coarse wear debris. So the industry has is very much aware that Spectroscopy has limitations. In addition to that, it also knows that the types of wear that can happen uh, may not be indica indicative uh, or may not be detected by very small um, wear debris. And in that situation, anything greater than five microns, there's usually a requirement to check that each time. 
uh, there's a variety of methods to doing uh, wear debris analysis. Uh, it's often known as filter debris analysis. It can be measured by X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. It can be looked at with microscopy, either optical or scanning electron microscopy. It can also be done by direct imaging particle count. You can also do some uh, ferrography. It's a very effective tool. It's just that it because it's qualitative, um, you need to have a skilled diagnostician reviewing it. What's of interest in there is that's looking for fatigue bearing wear. So sometimes there are certain wear conditions where you don't get a small buildup of particulate. You get a large burst of particulate all at once. Fatigue uh, wear is an example of that. Uh, you can also get two or three body abrasive wear, which large particles get produced quickly. Morphology is very helpful in aiding a root cause analysis. And what's unique about this industry is that the OEMs place a... Uh, have a very distinct uh, detail uh, information available to the end user where they talk about guidance and diagnostic documents, talking about the size, the shape, the morphology, the alloy content. And uh, engine ISO codes generally are exceptionally clean for this. 14, 12, 10 and below for a collective amount of particulate is not unusual, but with specific focus on alarms that are, are ferrous or or um, metal uh, based. Another type of uh, level of, of part of properties that we watch for is cleanliness, fluid degradation, and fluid contamination. In cleanliness, we're looking at overall particle counting. What's the general cleanliness level? Particularly important for hydraulic systems, of course. Also important for some en engine applications. Um, it's often specified in there. Laser or direct imaging, you're looking at ISO 4406 or NAVIAR codes are used in those situations. For fluid degradation, we also look at oxidation by infrared um, and total acid number. And for fluid contamination, we look at things... We look for things like water, coolant, or de-icer uh, fluids, or, or fuel dilution uh, issues. How that's measured is a variety of different methods. But what's important here is we're looking for overall contamination and uh, uh, fluid degradation concerns. So we look for fluid performance issues. What's unique in the aviation industry is valve clearances are extremely small. Um, in addition to that, the pressure, the overall pressure of the systems range from anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 PSI with exceptionally clean requirements. In the case of the contamination of the oil or degradation of the oil, we're worried about premature stress on the oil, any coking or hot spots that may occur in the engine. Um, we're looking for electrical conductivity issues. If the, if the additive is not correct, in there, there's a change. We have an increase or a sensor or a diode that's uh, short-circuiting. That can cause problems with the oil, and that can be picked up with the infrared. Oxidation values are very low. You have a very small change for acid number. And then we also have something called alien fluid. So something you don't want in an aviation application is, for instance, a fire-resistant fluid to be added into a mineral-based fluid or ester-based fluid or vice versa. That type of mix-up will cause sludging and it will cause a miscibility issue, which can cause problems, of course, uh, when the aircraft is in flight. And in the case of the liquids that could be getting into the system, we're worried about leak detection predominantly. So if we've got things like glycol uh, due to de-icer, it could be because of some leaks getting in. We could have a breather malfunction getting into the, uh, to the fluid systems. We're very worried about those type of things. So ice uh, is, a, is a concern in our de-icer fluid can affect the corrosion inhibition. If we get water present in the system, that's never a good situation because it can also indicate that there's moisture coming into the system. You don't want all water in your fluid building up because that can cause some ice build up in flight, in line, and that can cause blockages. And then last but not least, we also look at fuel dilution in hydraulic systems in aircraft applications because the fuel is actually used as a coolant for the engine. And if you have any uh, integrity issues there, you get fuel getting into the hydraulic system and we need to keep that under control. So suggestions for on-site analysis for aviation applications. Uh, investigate the Minilab solutions, um, the Minilab um, 153 systems or the EL 123 systems are good candidates to review. 
um, with the TrueView software, which allows you to develop your alarms and diagnostic systems. And of course, for military applications, consider the Field Lab series, which have that XRF uh, wear uh, debris detection for large debris.